So, hi guys. Um, I'm very, very grateful to be here and to speak here and very grateful that I recognize a lot of the faces in the crowd. Uh, the last time that I stood at the front of a congregation, I was probably seven years old and I was pouring the water for my youngest cousin's christening. So um, not only is it a lot to be up here speaking to you all today, it's a lot to be at the front of a church up here today. But all of that aside, I'm going to try and keep this under an hour. I know exactly how uncomfortable those pews are and you guys need to let me know if I'm speaking too fast. I grew up outside Toronto. Everything in Toronto happens very, very quick. And if you're not talking fast enough, they will ignore you. So if I get going too quick, just kind of let me know, put your hand up, kind of go, yo, Colleen, you're going too quick. And it's like, all right, that's fine. Um, the other thing I have a tendency to do is I flip flop the middle numbers in years. So when I get talking about the history, if I say 1964 instead of 1694, that is my fault. <laughs> and I don't do it on purpose to be funny. I do it because I flip flop the numbers. But today I'm here to talk to you guys about ceramic, color, and community, and how all those things come together so we can examine wealth patterning during the French period of occupation here in Placentia. Just a little bit about me to get going. Um, as you can tell uh, from this picture especially, I've always had a fascination with things buried, whether that be my mother's carefully cultivated tomato garden or the dinosaurs that my father hid in my sandbox for me when they put up the sandbox to keep me out of the tomato garden. Um, I actually wanted to be a paleontologist for a very, very long time uh, and then wanted to be a marine biologist for a little bit and came across a bunch of dead jellyfish on a beach and decided I didn't want to do that anymore. So paleontology it was. <laughs> um, in high school, I had my dreams crushed because in order to get into U of T's highly competitive paleontology program, you needed a 75 in math and I did not have that and I was not ready to move across the country without my parents at 19. So it became archeology. span I graduated uh, with a honors of bachelor's degree from Wilfrid Laurier University in 2019. If you're keeping track, yes, it took me an extra year. No, I don't want to talk about it, but we're going to keep moving on. <laughs> um, I've actually worked for three years as a field technician with This Land Archaeology Incorporated, which is a small company uh, situated in southern Ontario. We do a lot of uh, CRM work, cultural resource management work. And I learned today that they've gone bankrupt. So that's how my day's gone. <laughs> um, uh, in 2020, I was happy to be accepted to a Master's of Arts degree at Mil uh, Memorial University. I'm supervised by Catherine Lazier, who is here today, and Barry Galton, who is out in Fairyland. But my research project is entitled A Wealth of Small Pieces. Before we get going too much further, I want to make sure that you guys know of my research goals. Now, I could I came across this a lot when I first started here is that I would overwhelm people with a technical jargon and that wasn't helpful to me, that wasn't helpful to them, so I've kind of distilled it a little bit here. Um, my primary research objective, and my god I can't read that, um, <laughs> I'm studying ceramic assemblages from Fort Louis, which is across the bridge in Jersey side, if you're not local it's that way. Um, somebody will correct me if that's very, very wrong, to monitor how they vary, how these ceramic assemblages vary during the occupation of the fort. Ceramic can be used as a proxy, which allows me to study uh, provisioning commercial networks and the wealth that would have been associated with plaisance between 1655 and 1713. My secondary objective, you are all helping me fulfill today, um, I'd like to initiate discussions with the community of Placentia and more wildly with Newfoundland and Labrador as a whole because this sort of thing allows me and my fellow archaeologists to fully participate in the heritage and the legacy of our province and indeed of our country and indeed of our world. My mouse keeps doing strange things because I'm going to... So when I got involved with this project, it was actually very, very important for me personally to engage with a project that had a community component. I want my work and everything I do, especially what happens here, to be as accessible to the people that that research is for as possible. So much, so much of archaeology is hidden behind paywalls and academic jargon, and it really doesn't need to be anymore, especially as we, as we progress further and further into what will become our collectivized future. Um, I don't want my research to be hidden behind paywalls. 
I want my research to be available to anybody who can have it at any point in any time, whether that's via email, via book, via, I want it to be done for the people. Um, 12 years ago, a gentleman by the name of Ron Williamson, who excavated the largest Huron-Wendot village ever found in southern Ontario, took the time to explain to a 13-year-old with braces and bushy hair what his archaeology project was and how much it meant to the people of the town where I grew up and how much it meant to the people that no longer occupied that space. And I want my research to do the same thing for some 12 or 13 year old, they're not that short, some 12 or 13 year old with bushy hair and braces and acne. And I want to be that person for somebody else, whoever they are. Um, I have noticed in my time here, I haven't been on the island very, very long. I've been here about two months, um, especially in Placentia, but all across Newfoundland, there is this interest in, in uh, in involving the community in archaeological investigation. This requires a symbiotic relationship, which means it's a relationship that goes both ways. This two-way relationship is then in part a two-way benefit to both parties. Um, the archaeologist receives a transfer of knowledge in life pattern and local culture, um, where the community gets the opportunity to engage with their past in a very, very unique manner. This presentation that I'm giving to you today is built almost entirely on questions I received from the public because I was either talking too fast or talking too fancy and people needed me to explain that in a way that was accessible and I want my work to be accessible. Um, it's also something very, very important to me that um, people have the opportunity to touch history. I am a tactile learner, I am a visual learner, so it's great to hear about stuff it's something else entirely to be able to put a 400 piece of pottery in your hand and think, oh my gosh, I am holding something that somebody 400 years ago held and drank out of and survived out of. And that's just, I, I think that's cool. Um, we're gonna move on. I'm not gonna lie to you, it says brief on the slide and that is a lie. Um, <laughs> My supervisors have been trying and sometimes succeeding to get me to work on my brevity. Um, it doesn't always work. <laughs> if you're an avid historian and you're very, very interested in the names and the dates, come talk to me. I will send you, I've got timelines, I've got lists of names, I've got all sorts of stuff like that, and I will eagerly send that out to you. Um, but until then, uh, we will try for the brevity and uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, the thing with French history is that there's a lot of moving pieces. So it's not just history that occurs here, it's history that occurs apparently at my elbow. It's history that occurs in Europe. It's history that occurs on the ocean. It's history that occurs hell in Asia, if you wanna talk about how interconnected history is as a whole. Um, France is constantly at war from 1655 to 1713. There might be four years where they're not at war. Um, there are monarchs that die. There are empires that rise and empires that fall and empires that begin their uh, moments where they come into power. But thankfully, this place, Placentia, Plaisance, whatever you wanna call it, is incredibly well documented. I would go so far as to say it's one of the most well-documented colonies in Newfoundland, if not in all of the New World. However, don't quote me on that. Um, there is recorded correspondences, not just from the governors, from, but from the people that lived here, and those correspondences are recorded in English and in French. Uh, my French skills are uh, very, I'm very good at reading French. My uh, oral French is, is not great anymore, but that's all good. I can read it, so we'll get what we need to get out of that. In 1655 and 1658, depending on what sources you read, the first colonists arrive here. They arrive here with next to nothing. They arrive here with the clothes on, the, on their backs and whatever they could carry. Um, they arrive with so little, I'm scared I'm beating the crap out of your recorder, Lee, I'm sorry. Um, they arrive here with so little that they actually have to take advantage of Boston mercantile ships that have uh, anchored in the harbor. Uh, these ships are the reason why these colonists are able to take a foothold here and why they're able to survive. Um, this 
place, if you haven't ever looked at a map, is incredibly notable. All your big explorers note this place. Uh, John Cabot takes note of Placentia Bay. Uh, Jacques Cartier take no takes note of Placentia Bay. And especially Samuel de Champlain takes note of Placentia Bay because it is defendable and it is so close to the fisheries between here and Saint-Pierre. And because of its unique ability to be defensible, there are three French forts built here, uh, an additional couple of English forts built here, and I dare all of you to keep their names straight because I was trying to do it and I couldn't do it until I got here. In 1663 and 1666, we have Vieux Fort that's erected on the harbor side of Mount Pleasant, which is behind me-ish. Um, and that is the first fort that is built here and the first fort that begins its defense of the bay. It's never much more than a palisade and a couple of guns, but what it is is that it represents the fact that the French are willing to fight for this place. As we progress forward in time, we come upon 1669, and it's important to note here that Versailles is being built by uh, King Louis XIV, who is this lovely gentleman in his fancy shoes. And his sinking into and uh, preparing to make Versailles what it becomes is notable because he is sinking what is the equivalent of millions and millions of dollars into a very fancy hunting lodge. A year later, in 1670, see I did the flip floppy thing with the years, in 1670, Plaisance bucks up the courage to ask for money. They ask for about 10,000 leaves a year, which is modern equivalency depending on which uh, conversion tables you're using, equals out to about $150,000. Yes, that's a lot of money. For this man, it's a drop in the bucket. Or it should be a drop in the bucket. It's not. Because he goes to war two years later. In 1672 and up into 1678, the Franco-Dutch War wages. And then 10 years later in 1688, uh, between 1668 and 1697, the Nine Years' War begins and ends. The Nine Years' War is important to note because it is the first global conflict. It takes place not just on European soil, but on North American soil as well. In the midst of the Nine Years' War in 1690, Plaisance is actually attacked from behind by 40 buccaneers from Fairyland that come across the land side. They don't attack them from the water, they attack them from the back. They burn down Vieux Fort, they round up all the colonists and lock them in the church that would have stood on these very grounds, and as I check to make sure there's no kiddos in the audience, their governor is tortured on the front steps of the church. You don't tell that to everybody. However, we're all adults in this room, we're mostly adults. Um, once the colonists are released, because the buccaneers want nothing more to do with them, they've plundered and pillaged Placentia and they have nothing else to give or nothing else to take, um, refortification begins at my little fort, Fort Louis, in 1691. Um, Later, uh, under uh, Jacques-François de Montbaton de Brouillon, there's 12 governors in 60 years, there's a lot of names going on. Um, under this gentleman, he is charged with fortifying the entire bay. So the Gaillardin is erected um, between 1692 and 1695, and construction begins on what becomes Castle Hill, what they call Fort Royal, beginning in 1695. However, back home in France between 1693 and 1694, there is major crop famine. This desolates France to the point where they have to give away most of their navy and they actually hire privateers in order to man French ships to do France's fighting. In 1697, with the end of the Nine Years' War, the Treaty of Ryswick is signed. France manages to keep control of the St. Lawrence Seaway, but they have to begin to pay tariffs on any of their goods that leave this area and head back to Europe. Plaisance has a couple of golden years between 1696 and 1700, but in 1700, Charles II dies. Uh, Charles II is the Habsburg to end all Habsburgs. He is so inbred that he cannot have his own children. So he names King Louis XIV's grandson as his heir. This man is Philip V. However, 
when we launch into the story of Philip V and the War of Spanish Secession, we figure out that uh, a Franco-Spanish coalition would have been devastating to the English that were just coming into power. So they do everything in their power to not put a French man on the Spanish throne, but an Austrian man on the Spanish throne. And they eventually succeed, of course, because they're the British. And <laughs> but we've got a couple things to do before we get to their success. In 1704, Plaisance is ravaged by dysentery. At least half the colony is affected. I don't have numbers for how many of the colony die, but it does affect them in a major way. In 1706, France goes on the defensive and Plaisance stops receiving their money. Uh, in 1708, there is an English blockade that closes the mouth of the harbor. Um, and this is where Plaisance becomes the place of resilience that I know it to be now, a month later. Um, Plaisance was the portrait of economic dependency. They relied so heavily on everything that came in and out of the mouth of that harbor that when the English cut it off, they aren't sure what to do with themselves. By 1709, France knows they're going to lose and a famine takes a hold of the colony. France does nothing to remedy this. Plaisance is left alone. The only reason they survive, we think, is a combination of uh, colonist ingenuity and interference, well, interference, um, help on behalf of the Mi'kmaq, who helped to keep them alive. In 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht is signed, and one of the final things that the French are permitted to do here is they're permitted to stay the winter because the English think they're being kind. Um, in 1714, any Frenchman who would not swear fealty to the English crown is given uh, the opportunity to leave, and they go to Cape Breton, Louisbourg, and Acadia, where the French still hold power. Moving on, I, how was that for brief? I tried my best. <laughs> Moving on, we get to a brief archaeological history, and I promise this one is more brief, because in... Uh, 16, no, I did the thing, 1969, Jean-Pierre Prue, I try my very hardest to pronounce this man's name, writes what I have been heard to be called as Placentia's Bible. Um, this is a military history of Placentia, the study of the French fortifications, and it's quite a testament to how hard this gentleman worked because 50 years later, my citations are coming out of him. He knows what he's talking about. Victoria Taylor Hood contributes to this Bible in 1999. Uh, her thesis is Religious Life in French Newfoundland, and this takes a much more personal, much more colonist level of interaction sort of thing and kind of breathes life into how the people were when they were living here, not the garrison. Um, between 2001 and 2004, Amanda Crompton and Blair Temple excavate in the area. They do most of their excavations at the Via Fort, but they also begin pardon me, preliminary excavations at Fort St. Louis. I believe they dig up a little bit around the hospital and they may have done some stuff at O'Reilly House, but don't quote me because it's been a while since I've read those reports. In 2006, Steve Mills continues excavations at Fort Louis and in 2008, Stephen Fry continues those excavations. Between 2009 and 2011, Matt Simmons, who I have met and appreciate every ounce of help he can give me in this, finishes and concludes the excavations at Fort St. Louis, and he is the one that gets the deepest. They actually go down as far as three meters to get at French period of occupation. Um, between 2010 and 2011, James Littleton is here in Placentia, and he actually builds the catalog that I have been working from with the help of the community. And I think that's super cool because I get to see how everybody sorted things, and that's really, really awesome. But the question becomes, how everything intersects and how it is that I interpret that intersection. The big question that I got asked a lot was why ceramic? And the answer is fairly easy and it's because most of the work is already done for me. Ceramic is incredibly well studied. If there's a typology to be heard of, there's a paper written on it. Ceramic changes incredibly quickly. Um, I've actually compared it to the modern smartphone because in my lifetime, we go from those lovely little Motorola flip phones with the antennas that I've seen in like television shows to these magic boxes that everyone has in their pockets that can calculate and surf the internet and do all this other crazy stuff. But ceramic is incredibly well recorded. 
We have sources that can go back as far as 200 years about ceramic typology as we move forward through time, and that is exceptionally helpful in trying to do what I'm doing. Um, from these historical records that we have, we can interpret price, and we can also deduce ceramic usage, which is very, very helpful. And from price and ceramic usage, we can extrapolate wealth and how wealth changes across time. But another big question that I got quite a lot was, okay, but how are you doing that? And it's like, I just told you how I was doing that. <laughs> no, Colleen, how are you doing that? It's like, okay, give me a second. Um, so what do I, as, and I put archeologist in quotes because I'm not licensed, archeologist, um, consider when I'm analyzing ceramic. There's several things to keep in mind, especially when we're trying to do this, especially with wealth from these small pieces. Form and function, place of origin, fragility, and glaze color and decoration. Do I have a note on that? I flipped the page and I didn't do that. Um, yeah, no, I got there. So we're gonna keep going. We're gonna begin with form and function. So, at first glance, I, most people would consider form and function to be almost the same thing. And yes, but no. So form is more about what shape the ceramic vessel is, while function is what that shape was designed to do. In theory, objects that can perform more than one function should be more expensive. But in the past, the inverse is true. Exclusivity is the path to luxury. And luxury is what costs more as you go forward. Um, so if you think about a teacup and a saucer, those can do precisely one thing. They can be used to serve tea. However, if you consider something like an olive jar, an Iberian olive jar, then you get into, okay, well, an olive jar can be used for transportation. It can be used for storage. If I break it in half, maybe it could be a bowl. If I break, if I punch some holes in it, maybe it could be a makeshift colander if I really needed it to be. But if you break a teacup in half, you've just got a smaller teacup. If you punch holes in a teacup, your teacup's useless. So it's all about how things are made and how their usage continues going forward. The second thing we wanna consider is place of origin. Now I know, this map is a lot, and I hope you guys can see the little red balloons, because the little red balloons are representative of where ceramic excavated for, from Fort Louis comes from in Europe. Uh, note to my chagrin that uh, with all of that French history, not all of the objects that come from Fort Louis are from France, because of course it had to be more complicated. There are huge component and artifact deposits that are not only English in origin, but German in origin, Portuguese in origin, Spanish in origin. Stuff comes from everywhere. And it's just another facet that, with my research, that I have to contend with and wrestle with. So it's not only what influences cost on the ceramic itself, but what it costs to get ceramic to a port city to get that piece of ceramic to Plaisance. So if you consider something like Westerwald, which comes from Cologne, the, the, wah, the one in Germany, um, that has to go, it's actually traded by the English, and that has to go into London to get on a ship to go from London to Plaisance. But the Plaisance is not supposed to be trading with the English, so they have to make a stop somewhere else in order to trade with the French. If you take into account the stuff uh, from the northeast of, northeast, northwest of France, um, that stuff does not have to travel nearly as far. So that just has to get on a cart to get to a port city like Saint Malo, to get put on a boat to go to Plaisance. It's about the steps in between. Uh, another big question I got when I was talking about that to people is, okay, but how can you tell where the ceramic comes from? And it has to do with the fabric of the pieces that I have in my hand. So clay looks different everywhere you go in the world. I can tell you in Ontario, our clay is mostly brown. It's very, very sticky, and I hate digging it. In Newfoundland, I actually don't know what your clays look like because I have not yet had the opportunity to dig here, but I can tell you that clays from France look different than clays from Portugal. 
and clays from Portugal are very, very orange. They have this lovely terracotta color, and whereas clays from France are often very, very gray or very, very buff. I would call buff cream if you put it on my walls, but the, all the terminology calls it buff, so buff it shall be. Um, thankfully, if these clay typologies exist, again, somebody has written a paper on them, and I can cite that paper, and I don't have to do the work myself. Even if this wasn't the case, it's the soil typologies that really make this what this is. And thank goodness that archaeology is a mul uh, mul has a multiplicity to its discipline, so we can borrow stuff from geographers that let us use their work in order to determine where that matrix comes from. So not only are there well-documented shape types, well-documented function types, but well-documented color types that help us determine their place of origin. The next big thing that I had to keep in mind when I'm doing ceramic analysis is fragility. So based on how items need to be packaged and how easy they are to transport. So a, again, a large vessel like an olive jar is actually used for transportation. It takes the place of something like plastic or styrofoam or cardboard. It's big, it's sometimes very ugly, and it's used to transport. It's not necessarily used to be put on the table. Um, whereas if you get something like this Nottingham glaze, this Nottingham typology, which is very, very pretty, it's also incredibly delicate. Built entirely for the table, you would not be putting anything in there, sealing it with wax, and then giving it a shake on a transatlantic voyage. Um, you also see, in my assemblage anyway, that there's a reflection of a lot more of a coarse typology. Um, it's not just a utilitarian reflection, it's because uh, as a, you just watched a word fly out my ear. <laughs> um, as a people, the Europeans aren't good at making porcelain yet. They're getting there, we get some beautiful f refined earthenwares, again like that Nottingham stuff and like this Bellarmine, but we're not making porcelain in Europe yet. And thank God because some of their first tries are not very pretty. There is actually very little presence of porcelain at all in placentia. Even when I go looking for the English typology, there's very, very little of it here. And that's just a reflection of the fact that Fort Louis in, uh, in particular is not a mercantile-based uh, expression. It's a military-based expression. So you wouldn't give your soldiers something fancy to eat off of even today because you know they're more than twice as likely to break it. The last thing I consider, and one of the first questions I was asked, was about color and how color affects price. Um, in my collection, I have a lot of earth tones. I have browns, I have buffs, I have grays. Again, buff is just a fancy word for cream. I would call it cream if I put it on my wall. Um, we also have several shades of blue. We have purples, yellows, some reds, and then something I want to call black, but is too blue to be black. Um, so when you're considering color, you will not only have to keep in mind the shape of the vessel, where the vessel's from, what functions the vessel can perform, but you now have to add on additional kiln time and additional decoration time. Because you can't just slap something like that Delftware pattern on there and hope for the best. It's just, it's not gonna stay, it's not going to survive crossing the ocean. Um, so if you take into account something like Beauvais, Beauvais is unbuffed, it is unglazed, and it, like, it's very, very coarse, and if you look at it, quite frankly, it's kind of ugly if you're comparing it to other things. This would cost far less than something like Saint-Ange, which is buffed, so it's smooth on the exterior, it's slipped, and then it's glazed to get that beautiful uh, candy apple green on it. And then if you compare something like the Saint-Ange, I'm gonna use my that one. If you compare Saint-Ange to uh, Delftware, Delftware is hand-thrown, the white glaze on it is a tin lead glaze, and then it's decorated with this beautiful blue pigment, and all of that is done by hand. So that's not some fancy transfer, that's not some fancy kind of stamp, that is hand-painted by somebody who took the incredible, incredible time to make these beautiful, beautiful patterns on it. A fairly good rule of thumb as we emerge from the medieval period is why is, um, I got ahead of myself, is 
why I did it again it is the is that the more blue or the more color that exists on an object, the more expensive that that object has the potential to be. But why the focus on blue? Blue pigment exists in exceptional rarity in nature. So I want you to think about a blue jay, a blue morpho butterfly, a indigo butterfly, an indigo bunting. Those things are not blue. It is your eyeballs playing tricks on you. It is actually a process of light refraction that allows these things to appear as blue as they are. And if you take away that light refraction, if you look at a blue jay on a cloudy day, they look kind of brown and sad and boring. But as a consumer-based capitalistic society, we always want what we can't have, right? And what we can't have is that color on the blue morpho butterfly. The closest we get is indigo. The scientific name for indigo is indigofera tinctoria, and you can actually, it's like, oh, blue tint in the plant. Perfect. Um, at the time, the good indigo comes from China. So now not only are we taking into account the where the ceramic vessels come from, but we have to take into account where the decoration is coming from. And the decoration is coming from very, 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 very far away um, this white and blue motif that you see on this little, uh, I believe this is a face paint jar, a makeup jar, or an ointment jar. This motif is seen on the tables of the rich for 500 years because it is very hard to do, do this. And everybody that tries to do this is trying to imitate Chinese porcelain. Chinese porcelain can be fired hotter can be fired longer, and because of that, it is incredibly delicate. So that already checks off one of the things that we're doing when we do ceramic analysis. On top of that, that fragility is coming from someplace very, very far away. That's another checkpoint off. It's incredibly well decorated, and this in particular can only form one function. So there we go. This is the epitome of what we are comparing everything else against because this is so hard to get your hands on. It is copied by the Delftware. If we go back, you can actually see similar patterns in it, especially this kind of um, chrysanthemum that's on there that is copied, that is borrowed, and that is put onto the Delftware because it looks like this. So. With all those things in mind, we come to Colleen's five Fs of ceramic analysis. Form, what does this vessel look like? From, where does the ceramic come from? Function, what was the ceramic's intended purpose? Fragility, uh, how much, uh, what would it take for this vessel to break? And faience, how decorated is this thing? When we take these five things into consideration, form, from, function, fragility, and faience, we can get cost or and slash or perceived cost. This is what I have to take into account for every vessel that was excavated at Fort Louis to build this interconnected network of wealth patterning and wealth expression. Um, what began as a sort of a hunting down treasure hunt of looking for um, old shipping records turned into a web of tracking cost, figuring out patterning styles, and exploring the psychology of a colony that was essentially given up on. But keeping this in mind, I would like to ask you guys, which plate would you pay the most money for? What additional details would you like to know about these plates? What sort of things are you considering? What additional functions could some of these plates perform that others could not? And what goes into these plates to make them what they are? I'll give you a second. Yes. Uh, the blue plate on the bottom left corner, right there with the small blue pattern on the side. Perfect. That's actually a really good guess, and that's the guess I want you to make. Uh, this is blue transferware with hand-painted details in the Delft style. So this would have been, it's a modern approximation of what could have been made between 1770 and 1820. However, that is incorrect. That's what I want you to think. That's what the five Fs would lead you to think. But that is incorrect. Is that real it is not real gold trim. Good eye. 
that is very, very modern. It's actually a Wedgwood Renaissance gold. Uh, those plates cost about 40 bucks a pop. The plain one is the most expensive one, and I'll tell you why. Because on the other side of this boring white plate is a little logo that is Versace's logo. So, and that's where we hit what I have playfully called research hiccups. So what we just hit with that stupid little white plate was scarcity pricing and monopolized markets. So if somebody is trying to sell you a $300 plate, which, ugh, it's all good, <laughs> I didn't get that face. <laughs> if somebody's trying to sell you a $300 plate and you need a plate, you need a plate here, you can't eat. You're gonna buy the $300 plate, regardless of how much it costs. Something else we run into, especially that I didn't, I didn't think of right away, was heirlooms and hand-me-downs. A lot of these research hiccups come out of the community. It's like, oh, did you think about heirlooms? And I'm like, no. <laughs> but these things remain in people's possession for a very long time, like beyond the point where they're being created by people anymore. So in my possession, I have Royal Dalton made in 1904. If I went outside and smashed it, it would ruin somebody else's archeological excavation because why, why the heck is there porcelain from 1904 up here in modern deposition? That makes no sense. The other thing we need, a couple other things we need to take in consideration are plundered goods, both English and French plundered goods, which may be why the English expression in my uh, assemblage keeps throwing me off so badly because I don't want there to be an English presence there but by the very uh, context that we are in Newfoundland, there is going to be English ceramic here because the English eventually take over. Something else to worry about is how desperate settlers, who they would have been desperate by 1708, choose to hold on to things rather than discarding them. So if you had a teacup, your teacup's seen better days, the handle on it's kind of chipped, it's missing a piece on the rim, but you've got a teacup still. If you don't know when the next point is that you can get a teacup, you are going to use that teacup for as long as you can. If you don't know when your next ship load full of teacups is coming into the harbor, you will use this teacup until you can't use this teacup anymore. And the last thing I, I personally need to really keep uh, ahead of is marginality and resilience and how people in Newfoundland are so resilient to everything that happens to them. <sighs> to rectify these hiccups, I have to remember that historical documents can be used as sources, but historical documents are also propaganda. So if you're writing something back to the king, you don't want to tell the king that you're doing okay. You want to tell the king that you need more money, you want to tell the king that you're starving, and you want to tell the king that you have no uniforms in your fort. So that one was a big culture shock for me. Uh, I have to learn more and more about how environmental factors may have helped these colonists survive. So I picked up a book on Monday that told me that there were walrus here. I didn't know that, but apparently they were hunting walrus. And it's like, all right, so maybe they weren't as hungry as those historical documents say they were. Um, another thing I have to remember, how much of the ceramic am I looking at is personal belongings brought over by settlers rather than sent over by the French crown. So as how many of these teacups and plates and that sort of thing were, came with the settlers rather than being sent. Um, the English presence, why is it here? Does, the, does that English presence explain why things are out of date and why ceramic trends are pleasant, present in Plaisance and Placentia for far longer than they should be? Um, the big question that has been on my mind for a very, very long time is where did the money go? They're supposed to be getting $150,000 a year. We know that the forts should be garrisoned, but they're not. They don't have uniforms, they don't have shoes, they don't have enough muskets to give to each of these soldiers. Where's the money? Because it's not in the ceramic. Uh, like I mentioned before, Plaisance sees 12 governors in 60 years, and a lot of them are recalled to France for discharging their duty badly. If you ask my humble opinion, I think that means they were lining their pockets. Um, the big question was, oh, 
Fort Louis has 28 cannons. There are 16 cannons pointed out into the harbor and 12 cannons protecting their flank into the behind. How much does a cannon cost in 1700? I don't know. Is that where the money went? I have no idea. And like I mentioned before, I need to understand marginality and understand discard patterns as a colonist 400 years in the past. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, I grew up on the outskirts of Toronto. If there was anything in this world that I wanted, I could drive two hours and I could have it. And that is not the case here today, and that is not the case here 400 years ago. So it's just something that I personally have to really, really wrangle with. It's like, right, they can't get uh, that one specific brand of socks that comes from Japan because it doesn't exist here. Um, and finally, well, less than finally, these are what, what my time here has done for me has really helped me order my thoughts and has helped me manage to develop my research while keeping my focus incredibly narrow and on track. Um, I'm still in the more questions than answers phase. I've been told I will always be in the more questions than answers phase. <laughs> and it's just personally frustrating. It's like, oh, but I want to know everything. No, Colleen, you got to put the, you got to, ceramic, ceramic only. Forget the cannons. Okay, okay, we'll do that. Um, it's allowed me to finish and finalize my understanding of the site and the way that stratigraphy and artifact deposition is uh, preserved, presented, and then processed by excavation, which has been very helpful. It has also allowed me to participate in a proud archaeological and historical legacy that spans the better part of 450 years. And I thank PASS and uh, the Archaeological Society for allowing me the permission to do something like that. What I hope my time here has done for you guys as a community is that it's allowed the community the opportunity to understand their history and their archaeology of something that happened at a site ten, at bare minimum 10 years ago. I've also hopefully allowed my humble opinion on how archaeological collections can be used to enhance tourism initiatives. And hopefully I've highlighted the opportunity for further excavation at some point in the future. This place is so archeologically dense. It is so culturally dense. It is so historically dense that I feel fairly confident in saying that I am but the first of many. You will get people that come back here and you will get people that want to do archeology span here because there is so much here. In terms of next steps, I need to rebuild a database based on how ceramic is expressed uh, in layers, not just vertically, but horizontally in terms of their locations on the site, which will involve touching every single piece. <laughs> um, but this will allow for a deeper understanding of where and how things were when they were put into the ground. Once I have this built up, I can begin to run analysis, not just visually, because I am a visual learner, but mathematically, which will be the proof in the pudding. And from that point, it's just about putting everything on paper. Until then, that's all I've got to offer. I will be back in August to speak to you about archeological ups and downs, exploring stratigraphy and the law of superposition at Fort Louis, because my God, I would have liked a lecture on that. It is very complicated. Um, and if the community is interested in having me come back, I would very eagerly come back. Um, special thanks, as mentioned, to the Placentia Area Historical Society and the Placentia Area Archaeological Society, who not only opened their arms and their resources to me, you opened your community to me. And as somebody who's come 3,000 kilometers, uh, suffered from several flat tires, and needed somebody when I needed you guys, I thank you for that with every breath that I take, if I could. However, I've got lectures to give, so I can't do that. <laughs> um, I would like to acknowledge the fact that I am funded by ICER, the Institute of Social and Economic Research, and the J.R. Smallwood Foundation. My supervisors are Dr. Catherine Lazé, who is here today, and Dr. Barry Galton. Um, they have been and continue to be exceptionally helpful and increasingly patient with me as they continue to tell me over and over again that, no, Colleen, you must focus on the ceramic. Leave the cannons alone. Um, there are a handful of people who know who they are and they know 
even without me mentioning them, that I could not do this without them. Some of them are here in Newfoundland, some of them are here in Canada, some of them have passed into a world that I no longer know. But I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart because I could not do this without them. Um, but thanks for coming out. Uh, firstly, do you have any questions? And secondly, I would like to acknowledge before the applause comes up, uh, James in the back who's running the tech today. He does a fantastic job. I have no idea what I'm looking at, um, but he his job has been, I would not want his job because I, there's so many wires and so much stuff to do. But other than that, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming out. Are there questions? Uh. <laughs>